Uh, and welcome to the uh, Academic Open Source Working Group call here. It's, like I said, good to have everybody. Since we last talked, a uh, couple of us have been to Brussels and back to, to talk about things uh, university open source as well. So it was good. We'll give you an overview of that. Uh, let's see. Today's question is how you relieve stress in 80s ballads. Are these 80s rock ballads, Claire? Are they <laughs> anything will do? <laughs> Disco, it'll go right back to like seven, late 70s. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Petting a cat is good. Show tunes also excellent. So, some really great ways to relieve stress or just shouting that could be <laughs> <laughs> into the air. <laughs> Sometimes the ballads are like shouting, but with an attempt to put tunes on top. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I did want to, Claire, I did put you on just, you know, some recap. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, you can give it here in a second. So I, I did want to just say that, um, you know, we had Chaos Con. It was just about a week ago today. And um, we had, you know, 65 people uh, for the event, which was a really good turnout. So we've typically been hanging out in the 50 range. So... Um, we are going to be having another Chaos Con event in Open Source Summit North America, which is in Seattle in April. So if any of you are going to be attending that, uh, more to come as we kind of set the schedule. I did want to um, give you, just kind of point out the keynote was Julia Ferrioli from AWS. Some of you may know Julia. She has worked with the Vermont Open Source um, University group there. Um, she had a paper. I think this is a CSCW paper called Beyond the Repository. If you haven't read the paper, I do recommend that you take a look at it. If you, and if you just like to watch the keynote where she talks about the paper, it's just really great. And the basically the premise is we need to think about open source as more than just work that occurs in a repository. So that's the title, hence the title of the, the keynote and the paper. Um, just absolutely fantastic. So thank you to Julia for participating. Um, we did have an afternoon session that was focused on on uh, university open source. Claire, do you want to give an overview of kind of what happened there? Yeah, so I will, um, I, I, what I'm going to do, so just in terms of what happened, uh, so we had a good turnout in terms of the people who are participating in that, which was really fantastic to see. Um, we had oh. plans that went astray, <laughs> which is uh, part of the course of a live workshop. So we had intended to do this kind of short examination of each of the four topics that are in the model that, um, that we've been working on in the past here. Um, I would say that we got so like embedded in the first discussion that we never went beyond that. So instead of going through the four sections, we actually spent much more time going over the first section, which in our um, work so far has been called research excellence. But the first point I want to highlight is that a lot of people got very grumpy about using the term research excellence because it means different things to different people. And I think, Matt, I think we felt that maybe that's not necessarily going to be the term that we might use long term because it certainly created an emotional reaction <laughs> that, that that kind of, uh, um, I think, surprised me anyway. But uh, so yeah, I think it might just be the overuse of the term excellence in okay. university settings sometimes. That would be my guess. And it's just defining the term excellence. So that was <laughs> that was it. That's 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 fair. Yeah, Zach. Did you, have comment? Did you have a comment, Zach? Oh, just that um I think in some ways it depends on who's there. Uh so like it's, that's why I asked in the chat like how many people were there, because sometimes like You've seen group dynamics where one like passionate person can kind of sort of tip a room. Um, and in the past, I've actually had like the opposite feedback. Um, years ago, I was working on a campus-wide initiative on reducing administrative burden, uh, which is a common topic in research administration. Um, and I had a, a, a very senior dean say, we should focus on research excellence instead. <laughs> so like, you know, I think, you know, had that person been in the room, maybe the notion would have been defended. So, um, but Fair I think point. it's it's good feedback we should take. Um, but um, anyhow. It's completely um, I, yeah, and, I, and I, I will say though, that it did come from a few places. There were, there were, there were mumblings from throughout the room on that one. Um, one suggestion perhaps might be that to, to complement research translation, one, one way of, of phrasing it that came out in the notes was, 
open source or research outputs and methods. So the idea of how how you do research and what you're producing versus the research translation as being a differentiation might be um, a more general term without value associated <laughs> to it or something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was the second point that I wanted to um, make is that a lot of the discussion happened around how do we differentiate between within the context of research uh, within the context of or sorry within the context of research how do we differentiate between open source being used as a way to get to your research output and then the output itself being open source software and that they, they are two distinct scenarios and in the context of the use of open source software there was a little bit of discussion around the idea of how do we know what are the healthy projects to use or which ones to use for a given domain um, so uh, I, I was part of one of the discussions where people were saying, you know, wouldn't it be great if for every domain you had here are the most popular open source packages for you to use? One person made the comment one uh, person was was a, a, a um, earlier in her research career. And she said she made the comment that no one ever told her what open source was. None of her lecturers told her what open source was. She was expected to figure that out for herself. She was expected to understand what she was permitted to do with open source software. And she knew none of that. She had to figure it out from her peers. Um, so I thought that that really struck me that that there seemed to be uh, she wasn't in the technology domain, but it just struck me that it seemed to be critical. She found it critical to her research, but no one explained what it was. No one explained how to use it, what to use when you knew what it was. So all of that she she would have felt as helpful. Um, the the next point uh, um, that was there was a lot around the idea of the um, how do you get credit for contributing to and creating open source? So this is something that we've talked about before, uh, but you know there was a lot of discussion around how, how do you count that? The question is, how do you get credit for that? How do you even know if it's happening? Um, there was also a specific discussion around the fact that there may not be one answer to that problem, because again, by domain, it might be different. So it may be the case that in certain domains, things like citations and linking into publishers and all of that sort of thing may be very important, but that in other domains, it may not be as important. So an example that was used would have been in the aerospace area where actually, you know, perhaps citations isn't as important as actually having examples of projects that are in use. Um, so I'm not sure about the subtlety there, but it's it's just worth noting that there's not one answer to these questions. So it, it's uh, that was really just my my takeaway from that. The next kind of broad area, and I'm just I'm covering these in broad sweeps. I've I've linked to the raw notes so you can look through them yourself, so you can get a feel for the converse, some of the conversations in the subgroups. But one of the um, one of the points that was covered was this whole idea of the broader system of publishers and funders and researchers and institutions and how they all work together in the context of open source software as a research output. Um, so I know that's a conversation we've all had before, um, but that was one that was echoed there. Um, there was some discussion about peer reviewing code as a research output and how that may differ than other research reviews. Um, and uh, the last point, which I haven't put in there yet, but I'm going to, is uh, the, the idea of research, uh, open source code as a research output and how it may or may not need to be sustained or maintained. So this idea, and then this, someone used the word stale code, how it becomes stale, if it becomes stale, if that's just a, an element or an artifact of it being a research output of a particular point in time. But this idea of maintainability sustainability and what's appropriate for a research output was another topic. Yeah, still important to do. I guess guidance around that is 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 uh is is maybe what people were, were, were thinking about there, Zach, and just what would be a good culture of norm. Francesca. Yeah. Um thank you for the summary. You covered a lot of points um and gave me a lot to think about. I'm curious if there was any discussion about like how are you defining domain? Is it very much that people in the discussion are thinking in broad sweeps like engineering versus humanities, or is it as granular as aerospace versus you know electrical engineering versus you know sustainability engineering? Um, I can give my perspective and Matt, please feel free to jump in because I'm sure I've also missed things. But I know that we were using, we were trying to use examples. So sometimes we're using very high level examples like technology versus 
health dom related domains. And then sometimes we're using examples like I was asking for one about what would might be a niche domain. And someone said, what was it? Something like astrobiology or something like that. And they were like, you know, that that community is very small. Like, you, you know, you wouldn't want to be having millions of downloads of your software to be successful in the astrobiology domain. <laughs> anyway, I didn't even know that existed. So there we go. Um, so uh, so I would say people were using examples, but the definition was not, you know, uniform. It, it depended on the context of the of the discussion. Yeah, we didn't. But, 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 yeah, we didn't try to set up any sort of like um, comparisons <clears throat> or contrast classes between different domains. Mm -hmm. And there's when Clara was presenting it, it was really at the broad level. And I think people just kind of brought in their own experiences. But the big takeaway for me was that it's very clear that depending on the domain you're thinking about, and, and no matter where that may be on the, like your experience with open source may be very different and your needs from right. a measure perspective may be very different. That, that was what hit me. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if it was the case of there were certain very fleshed out domains that were benchmarks for maybe other domains that were particularly niche, like astrobiology. So that's what I was curious about. I didn't pick that up. I understand your point, but I did not pick that up. Though I, I would say it was, it, it seemed clear that some domains had more experience in this area than others and therefore had more well-defined norms. But then it also became clear that you couldn't couldn't paste those into other domains because that context may vary very dramatically. So there was discussion about how, for example, in um like in the areas of things like NumPy and SciPy and all all of those areas that they there are well established communities and norms and you know metrics for success, I guess. But you know again, the very point was that that can't be translated into the astrophysicist realm or astrobiologist biology to realm and, and it work necessarily. Zach, could you comment on your comment that you put in the chat? Sure, I'm happy to do that, Matt. Um, so th this was in reaction to um, what Claire was saying with um, projects that um, are no longer maintained. Um, and uh, I sort of chimed in that that's actually still important because like, mm -hmm. you know, on the I, on the road to open science, um, we actually want all of those exposed so that like it's possible to recreate something, even if it's difficult, um, like even if your code doesn't run, it's still something. Um, so we want um, data shared with a DOI. We want code shared with a DOI and have those things be linked, um, even if they're not going to go back to it. Um, so the and and just um, the the comment I made was that the um, the the Mozilla and CZI archetypes, which I think are are helpful for me anyway. Um, the one here that would apply would be called Bathwater, which I, I don't plan on telling anyone in academia that their project is Bathwater. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like there's a that metaphor can mean a couple of different things. I don't think they mean anything denigrating by it, but um, uh, uh, so I, I think instead what I'd like to call it is like stable archive, just to like tip off researchers that this is something that we do expect everyone to do. Um, and just to flag it as not maintained um, somewhere in the, the repo. Um, so we had a project not too long ago in our OSPO where it was a, um, <clears throat> the project had concluded. Um, it was a humanities project and they needed guidance on licensing and all sorts of stuff. Um, but this is exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to park something for posterity. They probably weren't gonna develop it a whole lot further, but having that source code out there um, I think is an important contribution. So we want to treat it like respectfully. So that's why I wanted to give it like a more, um, like a nicer sounding label that aligns more with our values. Yes, yeah, Saeed. So I agree with everything you said, Zach. Um, I will add though that I've spoken to a few people um, who have said that they they literally will produce software, open source software for teaching purposes, training their grad students, whatever the case may be. And they, they don't want a permanent record of it. Oh, that makes perfect it, sense. Yeah, no, I guess I was thinking more aligned with um, uh, research publication and having this be part of a, a research related project. Okay. Zach, can I ask a process question that might 
be interesting to me and maybe other people on the call as well. How do you, how and where do you ask for that? Like, how are you, that information, how are you identifying folks that you need to? Oh, I think, um, I don't know that we, um, have a process exactly. I think, um, okay. this is, you know, work in progress. Okay. Um, but I do think that I think my gut says that there's like a kind of a long tail to the, the, um, research code that we're producing where like the, the stuff at the, at the top is like enterprise grade basically. Um, and that, but there's a kind of a long tail of, of projects that aren't as well maintained or maybe not even, um, you know, shared well yet. Um, so I don't know that for a fact, we don't have a project, uh, we don't have a process for identifying these yet, but I think in our travels, Francesca and I are going to come across any number of these. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. David. Yeah. Lorena had a great point in the chat, by the way. Um, oh, I had a, another process question. Um, you had mentioned um, linking a DOI to the research software. Um, is it, is there a process for, for doing that? Does GitHub enable that in any way? Yeah, they do. Actually, there's a, um, there's a pathway from GitHub to Zenodo is the one that we use most often. Um, and if you look at, um, Lorena can probably tell us more about how JOS works, but um, if your um, project then becomes a an article on the Journal of Open Source Software, it gets a cross-ref DOI there, but it also, there's a DOI um, from the repository also, and they link those in the metadata. So the metadata linkage is actually quite important. And because JOS has editors, there are people to actually like do those like final cleanup steps that I think are are very valuable. And it will link the, the DOI to a, the specific branch or version of the software? That's exactly right. So you want to get a DOI per tagged release. Um, and so getting everybody in our community to actually do tag releases and versions, like we're not all there yet. Um, but yeah, because if you think about it from a reproducibility perspective, like you like if you come across an article and it links to the software, you want it to be the software that matches the claims they were making at the time they wrote the paper. Not the new upgraded version that <laughs> they can't reproduce. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Great, thank you. There are a few comments in the chat. Um, Mike or Lorena, do you want to follow up on those comments at all? Or are you good? <laughs> just sitting as comments. I just give you a chance to to speak to them if you'd like to. Sure. I mean, I think uh, I, I think I said most of it in the chat, but it, it seems to me that you know, software purpose in academia. There's a lot of different types, right? And I don't want to make like you know, broad reaching conclusions about what those types are. But it seems to me that like, you know, when you see a unmaintained repository uh, that doesn't have a lot of commits, like in research software, that could be actually a very important signifier. Like it might still be used, right? Software like that. Because if you're meant to reproduce something, like maybe you don't want it to change, right? Um, so I think when when thinking about this stuff, you know, coming back from ChaosCon, understanding where the purposes of these different types, like where the different taxonomies of open source software and academia and like how is that relevant might be worth uh, considering. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, Lorena. Lorena put the link in the chat and here it's in the minutes as well. I didn't look at this, but it looks like it's a blog post that talks about how to do just this. And notice that it's from 2015, so this is not new. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, Claire, did you have generated a lot of discussion, which is great. Do you have anything else? I, I just wanted to emphasize the fact, um, which I probably didn't write up front, was that um, we, when we when we pitched the whole workshop, we were very explicitly looking for individual feedback. So feedback as, uh, you know, putting people in, in an individual perspective as opposed to a university or institution perspective, because we wanted to see what would be important to that broad community of researchers. So um, so I just wanted to make that point, which is what generated that discussion. And I think it did generate different questions than perhaps we had explored to date in, in the model, which sometimes we're coming at that 
overview perspective as opposed to the individual benefit perspective, maybe more. Well, cool. thank you, Claire. Uh, okay, I'll continue to move on unless anybody has any last comments. Uh, before I forget, I would like to recognize Saeed for his recent appointment to the board of OSI. So Saeed, congratulations on that. I don't <laughs> know Thank if you, you have any comments on that. I just wanted to recognize that. <laughs> uh well, maybe be careful what you wish for. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Getting on any board is probably that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I I I I, I think, at least the conversations I had with them, it's primarily to get more of the academic voice into OSI conversations. So um, obviously the kinds of conversations we have here and in other forums will be very important uh, for me to keep tracking. So definitely keep 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 these things going. Cool. Um, well, congratulations. And Thank you. Great. How long is the appointment? Is it? Uh... Uh, two and a half years, I think. Okay. All right. Well, uh, good. Great. So one of the things we talked about last time, and then I have a topic that I wanted to talk about, um, was an in-person meetup. Right now, I'm kind of leaning towards FOSSI, which is in Portland. I don't know how that that suits people. I see some shrugs. I know that it might be convenient for some people in California, <laughs> maybe less convenient for people on the East Coast. Um, but I didn't go last year, and I think I'll be heading out this year and would be happy to try to organize something. For us have they posted that. any information on that? They haven't. Um, the only thing I'm getting is that they are going to be doing it again. So it'll be on that same weekend. That What's that? Works. It's over the same weekend. Okay. So the time frame's about the same. Okay. Um, well, even if we have a couple in person meetings, that would be great. Um, but maybe I'll try to focus on something for FOSSI, which is in Portland in July. Um, and then I guess the question would be oh, yeah, Lorena. I'm sorry. Um, if, if I'm going back to the previous topic, but I was just sure. thinking that, you know, I shared this blog post that is from 2015 and um, I, it just, just it, it seems so obvious to me that we've had the technology, as, <laughs> um, we've had the technology, we have the solution, the technical solutions for uh, software to be included in the scholarly record, for software to be cited and so on and credited for a long time. So it's, but, but it's not happened yet. I mean, there's success stories to tell like JAWS, but it's still rather fringe in the big picture sense. And so really the question is why, why hasn't the culture changed? We, it, it, it the problem is more recalcitrant than creating an archive and knowing how to use GitHub and Zenodo and so on. Uh, I just wanted to, share that thought. Lorena, do you think we could make common cause with the the data community in terms of citation guidance and like piggyback on the things they're doing with make data count? Um, I'm also thinking about CZI projects for the data citation corpus and the software mentions corpus. I don't know, it feels like there's some new ingredients. In the yes, but ha has, has the data community solved this problem or are in the same Absolutely bandwagon? Not. <laughs> right. No. Right. So this so <laughs> so yeah, we can make a common cause, but the, the problem still remains and it's a wicked problem uh, uh, of um ingrained cultural um decisions that are seem to be immovable with regards to um, valuing a certain kind with, with regards to just pers the, the status quo persisting, right? I mean, the, the institutions don't want to change. They don't want it. it it's, I feel like we've been talking about these things for 15 years and nothing's changed. What about like UVA School of Data Science? So like okay, yes, there are few and far between examples where people where there there seems to be a, a shift. The needle has moved. I believe that University of Central Florida. I heard from somebody recently has uh, also incorporated some credit system for any 
publications that include like an open compendium, research compendium that has been published alongside and they give them extra points in their tenure and promotion. That's, you know, that is the only two examples I know of. <laughs> so there's a, um, there's the University of Maryland uh, psychology department. I don't know if it's software specifically, but like I'm talking about like the very difficult topic of promotion and tenure reform. Um, I mean, you're a faculty member, Lorena, for staff members like me, we're not even supposed to like be in this conversation. It's very difficult to broach these topics. Um, there is a Helios working group on um, on this. And I think it is sort of like looking for those recent changes and maybe trying to stitch something together. I'd be curious to find out if their January summit of like a uh, 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 leadership summit that they had in Florida produced any... Um, I haven't gone all the way through that report, um, but it's. I think things are warming. It's just sort of slow. And so I guess that's why I called out UVA, um, the data science school, because like, I think if we have exemplars and then we might be able to inspire other people that are closer to it. I don't know. It's don't a disagree. very, it's a very disagree. difficult topic. I have no disagreement with what you've said, uh, Zach. I just wanted to point out that we might, want to focus on the bigger and more difficult problems the technology so the, the technical solutions yeah, are yeah. already there yeah i agree with that yeah i i, I did look go ahead, no go ahead Said. uh I, I i did look through the helios report um and uh cmu's provost actually was willing to speak up there um on behalf of on on behalf of open science becoming part of RPT processes. So I got some feedback from him too. Um, but I think it's a gross generalization, of course, but I think that the main reaction from that workshop is, yeah, this is probably a good thing. We'll think about it, but it's complicated. And by the way, university presidents are being fired. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, and I, and I don't mean to be, um, that's not the right word, cynical, Machiavellian, whatever. But there is sort of a crisis, quite frankly, with higher ed right now, at least in the US. Um, and I think that that old adage of never waste a crisis, I, I think there needs to be a new narrative coming out um, of, of higher ed in the next, and I don't think this is going to matter no matter how the election goes in, in November 24, that th there was a bill the Department of Education would have more oversight of universities in the United States. I think 185 Democrats are behind it, right? So this this seems to be bipartisan, as crazy as that sounds. Um, and I think that universities will need to have a different message about what impact happens from universities, right? What relationship universities have with broader society and so on. And I think data and software can play a role in that. And again, that might be another be careful what you wish for a moment. Do you want to bring all that in? Um, you know, it seems like every week, day, somebody else has been, their dissertation has been scanned for plagiarism. Um, you know, so the, the, there's, there's a lot of scrutiny in some ways uh, and in others, there's none. So it, it's, it's a difficult conversation, but I think it's a difficult time for higher as well, and I wonder if there's a convergence there. If if I may just yeah, so I suppose fine. one of the questions I would that springs to mind from this discussion then and based on this group would be um if if we're trying to think about the metrics or measurements that we might look to build a model around, do we need to think not just of the potential benefit to either the institution or to the individual, but also its potential impact on changing that system at large. So I'm, I'm, I'm now thinking about the fact that if we are thinking about how to measure these things, if the technical answers are already there, for example, about how to get citations, then are we, are we just measuring like, you know, is, does it make sense to to measure that because that's a metric that's there and visible? Or or do we try to come up with some measure that were it there, um, it, it would have a more, uh, I suppose, catalyzing effect on the system to try and to try and make this more more of a thing? Because, you know, uh, I suppose I suppose my, 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 my question is, how, how do metrics 
um, how do the metrics we choose to focus on impact that particular scenario? That's really my broader question. Yeah, Mike, I, I got your, I think I got your note down here, Claire. I'm trying to jot it down. Yeah, um, I also had my own question or comment as well, but I thought I would let, see if <clears throat> any folks felt like they had an answer to Claire's. Um, if not, I can. Well, go my point was just yeah. that perhaps from a, from a um, measurement perspective, that if, if faculty had a consistent way of demonstrating that input, or that impact that they're doing with their software that might be beneficial. And that's something that we could perhaps provide. That's a very bottom up approach to things, which is very different than what Saeed was talking about, which from the Department of Education was a very top down kind of pressure. Um, the only, the only, it's still again, a, a process problem that if faculty provide this information and there's no process to receive it, it really doesn't matter. You know, if there's no RPT process that really cares about this information as being provided by faculty, then it won't make it won't make any difference. But it's something I think that we could think about. And Saeed, did you have a comment like on this comment, or did you have a different comment? No, on this one, um, I'll, I'll just say you know the answer to everything today is AI, um, and and the answer in some ways to this is AI, right? It, as AI becomes pervasive and important and does whatever it's going to do by people who are managing it, not on its own. Um, software will become, software and data will become very important, right? The, the, there will be increasing attention placed on the software and data in these AI models. And that may have a tilting kind of effect in terms of the RPT or the sort of recognition of what academic work has an impact in that area. I wasn't sure if I should raise my hand again or no, uh, you go, Mike. Okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, echoing what you said, Matt, um, I think, uh, well, one, I always found Sean, I know Sean's not here, but I always found his story interesting because, you know, it as I understood it, and maybe this is something to discuss next next meeting, but you know, Sean's university didn't have specific policy around like rewarding contribution to open source software, right? But from what I gleaned, you know, Sean being the lead developer on Augur used Augur to, you know, develop, uh, essentially collect a, a lot of quantitative data uh, around his contributions and impact of his work, and then showcase that at, like along the lines of saying like, you know, this is significant contribution to my, to our, our my, my field of study and work, right? Um, and so I think, you know, while for sure there are, there's not really a significant amount of understanding, particularly like in people who have been super successful in academia around this type of contribution, because like, if you're gonna be a Dean, you probably have went through the most standard path of reward. But if we can find ways to, you know, both provide like the necessary infrastructure to, you know, collect the necessary data to make the justification of impact, and then standardize ways that you can show value of that impact that is along, you know, scholarly lines, you know, I think that is maybe a more feasible approach particularly as I see like the resources within this community uh, and what we're able to do. Um, but I'd be curious in other folks' perspective on that because I know we're kind of going back and forth between the bottom up and then like the, the potential top down. So what did you want to comment on, Mike? Just I guess. In, just in terms of like how to make the alignment between like software development kind of like or any contribution any open source contribution for that matter and how it is aligned with a scholarly profile like that yeah like you know frankly when i joined this group my thought was okay we have like basic metrics around open source software contribution and community health that like exist in other working groups 
but what are the specific types of contributions that academics make towards you know open source communities and what's the value of that that this is that's my comment is like you know when i think about this working group figuring that out is is i i think one of the more valuable contributions that we could make towards reforming rpt in that's universities fair. yep i like that and i mean i think that comment kind of encapsulates a lot of everything that's been said on this rpt like how do, how do we how do we provide some structure to to identifying that um so Lorena, look what you did just by asking about the RPT process. <laughs> <laughs> for for what it's worth, I mean, just in terms of um, changing a process as well, I'm I'm on a committee to change our own RPT process, and these are from guidelines that were from 2002. So I mean, just these guidelines become institutionalized from a long time ago, <laughs> and then just the process of reform is not just a an ad hoc committee making the changes and then running with them. It's to bring those back to faculty and suggest the changes and then trying to move these all the way up administrative channel. So it like, it's just so like, just moving. This is so challenging. Um, and it's taken well over a year to even get to where we are. And nothing has been approved at this point, just <laughs> as a note. Uh, yeah, Daniel. I just wanted to echo something Lorena said that really resonated that sounded really right in a lot of levels that it's a wicked problem and it's a cultural problem um, and that all the carrots and sticks that we can describe all the structures that we can implement are valuable and they shouldn't stop uh, being developed um, but at some level that the culture is something that needs to be shaped and the, the metaphor that jumped to mind was the, the music industry and how the music industry goes through cycles uh, where uh, there are zine counters who are running the record labels, and then there are artists who are running the record labels. And when the artists run the record labels, you get amazing musical movements uh, happening. You get you know, you know amazing cultural scenes that happen. And when the zine counters are running the show, the, the, the record companies make money, but the music often, uh, the quality is often derided by critics. Right? And so there's this like tension that exists within academia, it feels like, between the people who want to just do amazing academic work and follow their nose in terms of where that goes and uncovering new and, and discovering new and un, untold stories and un, undiscovered things. Um, and then there's the realities too, that like someone's got to pay for all that work and how do you convince the people who are paying for it that it's worth it, right? Um, and so that, that tension drives, I think, a lot of that cycle um, and it's just worth, just to echo Lorena's comment, I think it's it's, it's worth digging into that aspect of it at some point and figuring out what can be done to make that work better. I like the metaphor. <laughs> I'm afraid we're in the the not creative one sometimes here in academia. So Saeed. Um, I, I just want to mention that it's also a workload problem, right? Um, I, I think one of the reasons that RPT processes work the way they do is it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, and people are looking for proxies to sort of sift through what, what what is someone's impact. And they're not going to read all of the papers. They're not going to read all the citations. They're not going to do that. It's just, no one has the time. And now if you think about adding data and software, um, you know, are you going to go... <laughs> <laughs> run all the software, you going to process all the data. Um, so it, it, there, there's a sort of pragmatic hurdle to all this that's important to keep in mind, I think, uh, uh, as well. And uh, lastly, Jen's comment is a good one that, you know, th this, and I don't know what it's like for you, Matt, but from what I've gathered, you know, at CMU, and I don't think it's too different from other places, this is not something the provost announces and it cascades through all the departments, right? Uh, there's a strong sense that departments own this process, right? And that they understand their local norms and culture and so on better than anybody, including the provost. Uh, and attempts for the central administration to try and say, this is how it should happen, will almost certainly be met, be met with some you know, understandable opposition. So it's not just 
the university. It's it's all the specific entities that run these processes for their own departments. That's a that's a completely fair point. I mean, it happens at the college level, I would suspect, <laughs> which which if you just look at any university is happens to ha has to happen then six to eight to <laughs> ten times. <laughs> Yeah, and I and I, I don't want to speak for Helios because obviously they they should speak for themselves and there's lots of members. But my my understanding is probably what Helios is trying to do is find some champions, right? He's trying to find a few departments starting with just departments who are willing to take something like this on. It's all really interesting. Um, I, I hesitate to put this out there, but one of the things that we're doing in the chaos project uh, more broadly than just this working group is developing ISO standards around some of our metric models, not as process standards, but as um, just definitional standards. And I don't know if that would help, at least on this very particular conversation we're having here uh, a standard for a way of kind of assigning value through open source research contributions to, to research output. So it's just something that came to mind. I, I haven't thought through it and, and it may be completely not applicable at all. Um, and then Angela, by the way, we had this thing we were going to do today, but never mind. <laughs> but no, I don't, I don't mind at all. And I'd like to follow through on Angela's um, comment as well. Angela, did you want to speak to that at all? This is sort of ancillary, and it, it was actually prompted by this discussion we had yesterday about AI software and and how we're going to knit the whole conversation together. Um, but when we asked, you know, what would what would prompt? And again, this was like a very tiny part of a discussion that was very long. Um, when we asked what would help you know, the argument the most, it was, well, if granting agencies see, you know, software is important and they start recognizing it, then then that will help with the conversation. It turns out that NSF does recognize software as a research product and um, actually accepts it now on your CV uh, to support getting an NSF grant. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how far that goes for you, but it it's deemed important to everyone in our conversation. So it is what it is. <laughs> That's nice. Does this link have um, like a description as to how that's recognized? Without... Well, th that's actually the directions for how you recognize it in your CV. But... Yeah. Okay. And actually, that would be kind of probably nice for folks to even, if they're in a RPT review process, how to think about software if it's being recognized by the NSF. So that's great. Thank you for that, Angela. Uh, well, all right. We have four minutes, and I'm not going to unpack the next thing in too much detail, but I just wanted to let you know that I did from our conversation we had last week, I did um, summarize what we had talked about. And honestly, at the highest level, there does seem to be a lot of, from an OSPO or university, from your all perspectives, a lot of concerns around um, the upstream, so what is coming into the university, kind of thinking from a, an open source perspective, um, work that occurs within the university itself, and then naturally what occurs on, on the outbound or the downstream, things like tech, tech transfer. So what I was trying to do is, is trying to take those ideas um, and speak to how we could consider contribution and consumption um, characteristics with respect to monitoring and improving. So again, I'm not gonna unpack this here, um, but the hope is, is that down the road, we could perhaps start creating some guides or models that can help people better understand how to measure, for example, technology transfer or research reproducibility or how to discover funding for open source. Like, how, can we, how would we measure things like that within your university? So I'll bring this up next time. Um, Maybe I'll put it at the front of the meeting, <laughs> which is completely fair. Um, and I did want you to know that this was part of the Chaos Con as well. We asked the same questions, so or the same questions. So we got a lot of feedback from Chaos Con as well around this particular question. So with that, I'm going to say we're all good. Um, as always, this is just an amazing conversation um, from everybody. So thanks for being here. 
I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and have a great Wednesday. And maybe some of you are done for the day. Looking at you, Claire. And also looking at you, Mike, maybe. <laughs> uh, so enjoy the rest of your day and, and take care. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody.